everyone share with me one of their sentences from our lecture, the second week of lecture? What was, can you summarize the main idea, the main ideas of the second lecture, second week of lecture? That's not a sentence. Hurry. Go learning, more. learning or acquisition is based on social interaction, including empathy, imitation, and acceptance. Okay. Wow. Excellent. That works. That works very well. So, <laughs> learning or language acquisition is based upon social interaction. <laughs> Based upon social, uh, can you finish that sentence for me again, one more time, please? Is it social interaction? What's after the social interaction? Based, based on social interaction, including empathy, imitation, mimicking, and etc. Okay, good. In including uh, empathy. What? Imitation. Imitation. Mimicking. Mimicking, which is basically the same, etc. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay, what about third week? Can someone can someone share with me a sentence summarizing what we learned the third week? The third week is how how do symbols how do symbols gain meaning? How are we able to what what are the requirements? What are the requirements for a symbol to gain meaning? <coughs> Think simple. No. Not for the third. Third week. Third week. Come on. Stop clicking your pens and start thinking. Although, actually, the evidence shows that clicking your pens actually helps thinking. But I just tried to agree. Come on, you guys, hurry. Other classes are faster. Let's go. Think about, right? Let's go. Here. You guys all remember we talked about apples, right? Okay. Give me a, what was the second week about? Just what was it about? It was about what? Symbols. But how can these, these are just lines. How can these symbols have any meaning? Okay, becomes connected or associated with what? Okay, body-based experience or schema, right? Okay, so our second week is essentially that our body, body-based experience body-based experiences, which are basically just schemas Okay. become connected together, right, with symbols. Become associated with symbols. Again, what kind, again, let's look here. These are just symbols, right? What kind of symbols are these? What kind of symbols? You can see the symbol. Right? You can see the symbol. So I'm going to draw a picture of an eye here. Here's my eyeball. Okay? There you go. There's an eyeball. Okay? You can see them, this symbol. Also, I might say, sakwa. Okay? You can hear the symbol. So, it's a phonetic, phonetic symbol. Right? Here, this is an ugly, ugly ear. Here has many earrings. There we go. Emo, emo ear. All right. We also pronounce, produce the sound as well. I don't know if my camera can see this. So I'll pull it right here. Don't worry, it won't. It can't see any of your heads, so you guys don't need to be shy. Okay. <laughs> Geosystem. So we have the sound that we hear, that we produce, 
We also can see the symbols. And then these become connected together with what? For Sakwa. With the, okay, the experience, which we also can hear in Apple, right? When you bite into it, it goes, right? When it's a good crisp apple. You can also taste, so I'll make another tongue. This is my tongue. This is my, my big mouth. Small lips, but big mouth. Okay? You can taste it. You can also see an apple. We'll make another eyeball here. Okay? You can touch an apple. You have your body-based schemas. These body-based schemas become connected together with the symbols. Right, which these are the symbols, these things are all connected together, kind of like this. Okay? Got it? Good. Alright, sweet. Now we are going to move to school. We talked a bit about the home environment. Now we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about the home environment. You can move if you need to move so you can see things. So, all of you, all of you, when you started school, first grade elementary school, all of you spoke Korean. Yes. Excellent. All of the kids in your first grade class spoke Korean. All of them did. Now, all of you are at university now. Did all of the kids, all of the kids in your first grade class go to university? No. no. Probably not. Chances are not all of them went to university. Some of them maybe even quit high school. Okay? Now, one thing that, what is it? Why are some children behind other children when they start school? Any ideas why? Why are some children behind other children when they start school? Okay, maybe, I mean, I, I, for your generation, probably most of, none of you went to Hogwans when you, before elementary school. Mm -hmm. Kids these days, they go to Hogwans, it's crazy, it's stupid, it's a waste of money, <laughs> complete waste of money. But your generation, you did not go to Hogwans before school. So, let's think about your generation. Why did some of the kids start lower than other kids? Why not? Okay, that's what I was looking for. So, we're going back to the social interaction. Is that maybe there was a lack of social interaction within the home. Maybe there was less social interaction in the home. And then that maybe results in some kids being behind other kids when they start school. And that kind of, yeah, what are the differences between the homes of academically successful and unsuccessful children? Maybe the homes, the homes of successful children, children who are successful in school, maybe they have more social interaction. And social interaction is important for what? Certainly, very important for children. Very important for what? Learning. Learning a language. Learning knowledge. Requires social interaction. What do we measure? What do we measure in school? What do we measure in school? Even at the very beginning, what do we measure in school? Do we measure how nice children are? Do we measure how friendly children are? Do we measure how, um, how well they speak? What do we measure in school? Okay, how do we know what they know? Okay, okay, keep going. We, we measure what they know, we measure what they know with tests. How can a test, how do we know what a student knows through a test. How do we know? Score. <laughs> but how do we get the score? 
How did I get the score on your papers? Okay, the child has to be producing something, right? The child either has to be saying something, or the child has to be writing something, or in the case of math, math is, math is just a bunch of symbols, it's like another language, just changing and manipulating symbols in a way. So what we are doing is we're based, a lot of school, we are just measuring their language, language ability. Okay, early on it's more speaking, later it becomes more reading and writing. Same with math. Think about these things. Now, this is average. There's a big vari variation in this, you're going to see. Okay, but on average, this is for American children, on average, each kid heard, hears about 23,450 words per week. So every week, on average, they hear 23,450 words. Every week, 52 weeks a year. By the end of five years, the average American child has a vocabulary of about 2,500 words. Okay, So big quantity of input. Every week, lots of words. 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 Does a child learn the word the first time? No, we hear the words many, many times. Maybe the word the many times, or maybe the word don't many times, or maybe in my case, no, all right, many times. And then at the end of five years, after hearing millions, millions of words, at the end of five years, Kids have a vocabulary of about 2,500, on average. I hope you're writing. It'll help you get the, help me even see. We've talked about this research from a book that was um, published called Meaningful Differences. A study was done over three years where the researchers recorded all the conversations in the home and they found some amazing patterns. We've talked about this. They took microphones, they put microphones inside a home for three years. They did this for many homes. And with few exceptions, the more the parents talked to the children, the faster the children's vocabulary were growing. I don't like this grammar. I would have said uh, and the higher the children's IQ test scores uh, at the age of three and later. So what they found, they put the microphones in the homes, and they found that parents who talk more, parents who talk more, those children in that home had bigger vocabularies. You guys, don't write my words. Don't write my words. These are not even my words. <laughs> okay, someone else's words. Write your own words. Parents talk a lot equals big vocabulary, equals higher IQ test score by age three. Parents who talked more had children who with bigger vocabularies, had children with higher IQ scores by the age of three and on. The data revealed that the most important aspect of children's language experience is its amount, the quantity. The quantity was the most important part. Suseo, gentlemen. The quantity was most important, the quantity of social interaction. Large quantity was most important. The difference is the amount of cumulative experience. Cumulative means total. Total, it, a, a total over time, total over time. Amount of cumulative experience children had were strongly linked to differences at age three in the children's rate of vocabulary growth, vocabulary use, general accomplishments, and linked to differences in school performance at age nine. Amount of cumulative experience, here language interaction, Big quantity of language interaction, again, vocabulary growth, vocabulary use, 
and school performance later. Not just their first year in elementary school, but also future performance in school by how much social interaction at home when they were babies or when they were infants or when they were toddlers or when they were preschoolers. Social interaction then relates very well to future performance at school. And then they found some interesting results in the data. They found some interesting patterns. And quantity was a big part. I think quantity is most important. That's my opinion. I think quantity is most important. But we also did find some qualitative aspects as well. And, and I think those are also important also. And we'll talk about those. Now, what they found Again, remember, we looked at the average, average of how many words a child hears every week. The average, but there's big differences because we could have an average of somewhere right in here. But notice that children from professional families, professional families would be doctor, lawyer, teacher, architect, city government worker, Okay, and these children from professional families heard many more words, 45 million words on average for children from professional families. Whereas children in the poverty level families only heard 13 million on average. Big difference. And remember, we found that that amount of social interaction is very connected to school performance. Why? Why do you think such a big difference? Why do we think? Why do you think that professional family, professional families, the children hear many more words than poverty level? Any ideas why? I don't know why. We, they didn't talk about this in the research. We don't know why. Why do you think? Any idea why? No idea. You have no idea. Just like, ugh, 45, 13, ugh. No? No, re no idea? There's no correct answer. I don't know the answer. Anyone? Sure. Because professional parents uh, Use more various words. Maybe that that probably that might be it. That probably is the case. But but the variety you could you could have same quantity you could have same quantity but have bigger variety, smaller variety but same quantity. But good thinking. Any other ideas? Okay, maybe parents ask more questions, maybe they encourage, okay, that might be it, maybe. Okay, maybe professional parents just have more time. Maybe their schedule is they go to work at 9 a.m., they come home at 6 p.m., and maybe their schedule is more fixed, and then they have more time with their children. Maybe, that might be it. Maybe poverty, maybe poverty parents must work more time, must work more hours to pay for food and rent. Especially, especially single mothers, right? Single mothers have to work so hard. Single fathers as well, okay? Maybe that's connected with poverty as well. I don't, I don't know the research. I don't know the research, you guys, okay? I don't know why. I don't know why. But there is definite differences there in the quantity. Okay? We also found some general patterns in the quality of the interactions. Some general patterns. I'm not saying, we're not saying, oh, this always equals professional and this always equals poverty. We're 
We're not saying that. We're just saying on average, average patterns. We found that parents coming from professional families talked with children. It was more of a kind of conversational style. They did joint activities. Maybe the father builds a paper airplane with the son or builds a model. Involved the kids in tasks. Maybe when the mother makes dinner or the father makes dinner, they ask the child to come uh, join them to, to help make dinner. So they do tasks together. And also the parents were very responsive. Go back to our last class, right? How responsive the parent is versus um, the parent parental agenda. They answer questions, they're responsive. Whereas they found general pattern was that parents coming from the poverty level families more likely were talked at children. This is imperative kind of approach. Don't do that. Be quiet. Don't bother me. That's imperative speech. Also, right now, I'm being a bad teacher, right? I'm talking at you. This is not a conversation. Think about that. We'll think about that more. Parents spent little time playing. I understand. When, I'm, when I've worked really hard, I come home, I'm really tired. I don't always want to play with my son. He says, oh, some buckle chill. You go, you go hide, you go hide. I will count to 1,000. All right. They did not involve the children in tasks. The mothers or the parents or the fathers, maybe they just want to do the task quickly. Gesundheit. <coughs> They want to do the task quickly so they can finish and move on, watch some TV, or go to bed, maybe. And they admonish children for interrupting and asking questions. Admonish is kind of scold. Don't bother me. Don't interrupt me. Oh, why do you ask so many dumb questions? Because they're dead. Okay? And again, you guys, this, this is the home environment. But be thinking... Be thinking about school. Be thinking about school. Okay, how does this maybe translate? How can we translate this into school? One of the things we know, we know that children, children in first grade, the children who are the top students in first grade when they finish high school, they're the top students still. The kids who start at the bottom in first grade, they finish at the bottom, usually. Okay. On, on average. <coughs> Kids who start at the top, finish at the top. Kids who start at the bottom, finish at the bottom. Imagine that you're from a poverty family, right? You hear fewer words. Many fewer words. By the age of four, you come to school because you heard many, again, remember, many words is connected to our vocabulary. You heard fewer words, you have smaller vocabulary. You come to school, you don't have as much vocabulary. Damon teacher, always talking, really difficult, I can't understand. Low level student, oh, Damon talking, but I always understand. High level student, continues on into the future. See the idea? But there is, these researchers, again, they're, they're looking at average. They're looking at the average. Now, which of these groups, we have three groups here, and we're looking at the distribution, 
these three groups. Which group has the lowest average? Poverty. Poverty has the lowest average, probably somewhere right about in here somewhere. Which group has the highest average? Professional. Okay, professional. I I'm, I'm short, so I can't reach that high, but yeah, probably their average is somewhere right up in here. Okay. All of the poverty, the children from a poverty level family, all of them have low grades? No. No. All of the children from professional family have high grades? No. No. So they thought, wow, that's interesting. We have these professional and poverty level kids that are down here, but we have some poverty and working class, and of course professional that are up here. Are there any similarities among these families, the ones at the top? What do you think the similarities might have been? What? Go ahead. Okay, probably, certainly, that there was probably more social interaction. Anything else? They found something that was more significant than that. Something that was more significant, but yes. No. Good guess. Well, it probably, it, it probably very connected to more sentences and the social interaction. The answer is right there, you guys. <laughs> so, I mean, okay, you know, you, you can all be like, oh, oh, oh. all right. Anyone? Any idea what it was? Time spent reading at home. It was one of the things they found was that that was the same or similar across the poverty, the high performing. Poverty, the high performing working class, and the high performing professional. What was similar about all of these families across all the spectrum is that reading played an important role in the home. Parents read books, parents read magazines, parents read books to their children. And again, you, you guys can think about poverty, but we do have libraries. And libraries are free. So even that books are available to even the poverty level families, that you can find time to read a book to the children. And let's think about this. Why is, why is reading so important? Because remember, when you started school, when you started school, all of you spoke Korean. Some of you had bigger vocabularies, some of you had smaller vocabularies, but all of you spoke Korean, okay? Why, as we go through school, why is reading so important? Think simple. Reading can see more words. Yeah, work. Well, see more. Yeah, I mean, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look. The more the more you read, the more information you're able to develop. But not only that, is that you know that we measure we measure reading in school. To take a test, you have to read yes. to be able to be able to do the test. Right? And that reading, those reading skills are very connected to your writing skills. Yes. Reading and writing is more important in high school or more important in elementary school? High school. More important in high school. So as we progress through school, reading and writing becomes more and more and more important. The kids who have reading at home when they are very young, those kids, enter school at a higher level. They enter, the kids who have reading and writing at home when they are very young, enter school at a higher level. Reading and writing becomes more and more and more and more and more important over the course of school. They finish school at a high level. Write your own words, you guys. Write what this means. 
in your own words. Research by Gordon Wells has found that the amount of time parents spend reading to their preschool children is key for sustained academic success. You want to succeed in school over the long period of time. And again, this is in America. Uh, Korea, I think, probably less so because Korea is such a um, kind of test oriented, follow my lead culture, but key to academic success. So I want you to take some time. I want you to think about what does this mean. Explain the researchers' findings in your own word. You can talk with your group members, talk about what I just talked about. You can make notes. And then what I want you to do, talk about it together, share your ideas. I want you to think a little bit about How can we use this information as teachers? Together, talk about what I just talked about. In your own words, you can add to your notes. And then think about how can we use this information as teachers? Go ahead, begin. Okay. Uh, for the final portion of this lecture, I want to focus on reading and why we think reading is really so important um, in helping uh, children improve their vocabulary. And I especially want to focus on stories. And what we're talking about here is not specifically just to English as a second language or English as a foreign language. We're also talking about Korean as well. And so for you, my students, um, you live in Korea. Your students will primarily be Korean when you are teachers in elementary school. And I want you to really think about why helping them develop um, healthy reading habits will, will really help your students far into the future. Um, so again, we're um, uh, reading to your children uh, and students in Korean is an extremely important habit. Um, uh, it is a very important part of their of their academic success in the future, and I genuinely believe that. Um, and just so you know, reading English is a wonderful, easy, enjoyable way to bring a foreign language that many of your students might find um, uh, intimidating and difficult, it's an enjoyable way to bring it into the classroom, uh, reading to your students. And like I said, I really want to focus on stories. Why stories? And this goes back to the previous lectures that we talked about language acquisition and um, how symbols become associated with meaning. So, first of all, stories are enjoyable. Stories have been with, have been part of our culture, part of our society um, for a very long time, we think at least 100,000 years. This means that stories are probably, we probably have an evolved, um, uh, desire or enjoyment uh, for stories. Um, stories help a culture relay or communicate um, um, ideas and values within that culture. And probably those children who are receptive to the values and ideas passed along through stories are probably more likely to survive and be productive members of the society and of the culture. So I, I think that we that we have a that especially children have a natural um, um, inclination, desire to hear stories. Not only that, though, it, when we've been talking about how these symbols become associated with meaning, um, this. 
the example I used, the examples I've used have been very concrete, physical examples, for example, like the apple. But what if we take something that is not so physical and concrete? Let's take, for example, the word journey. How is it that we are able to then be able to apply our um, body-based experience uh, and grow those associations um, with the symbols? And I think that stories provide a very important context, and again, especially children's books, where there will be pictures that are then, um, that kind of match very well with the language that's being used. So how is it that a child then might be able to learn the word, let's say, for example, journey, um, which is very difficult to see a journey, but maybe over the course of the pages uh, in a storybook in which the character is on a journey and the book mentions journey a couple of times within the book, that provides an opportunity for a sensory experience of the child being able to, through the context of the story, seeing the pictures and then hearing the word journey multiple times, the opportunity to possibly learn language um, that is not particularly physical. So I really believe in stories, and, and we'll look a little bit more as to, as to really why reading is really important um, to assisting children in their language development. So, um, first of all, uh, reading is really a lifelong process. So the, the sooner that we can get kids reading um, and enjoying the reading process, it, I think that's really important is that they enjoy it but will really assist them far into the future. Reading is such an, such an important part of our lives, um, just for the rest of our lives, uh, particularly for our jobs and particularly for school and our education. Um, and when we help children become independent readers, uh, we also help these children become independent learners. So we want these children to be um, not just in learning within the classroom, we want them to be taking the initiative where they independently go forward in their life and, and enjoy the learning process uh, for the rest of their life. So I, and so I do think that, you know, in assisting children in, in enjoying reading um, helps create independent readers, independent writers, independent thinkers. And I, I like independent thinkers. Um, and children need teachers to read the, to them simply for the enjoyment. I'm very concerned and I'm very worried that, that we always try to, to take a child's education, take the child's learning process, and really focus on trying to, to maximize the, the, the learning that, that can be validated and verified. Um, whereas I would like us to more just focus on making reading a really enjoyable process. And this means that we, there'll be no, we'll talk about this more, but no pressure. Is that we just read to the kids for the enjoyment of it. Again, we're copying, let's, this is one example of copying the parent-child model, where the parents read to the children because the child enjoys the time that the parent reads to them in the evening. Okay. Reading is very important because it provides a, uh, a greater amount and variety of vocabulary than spoken language. When we speak on a daily basis, something that we use, at least in English, we use about 400 words. <laughs> Almost all of our uh, sentences, 95% of all the words we use on a daily basis are just this group of about 400 words. Certainly we use more words than that, a greater variety than that, but most all of the words we use are, are just this kind of basic group of words for our spoken language. Reading provides a greater variety of language. In written language we use a greater variety of words, so there are more opportunities to learn, to learn new vocabulary. Um, also, it takes children beyond their daily experience and exposes them to rare words. 
Again, for example, let's take a word such as submarine. Now I'm guessing that many of you have never ridden a submarine before. Uh, you have not experienced a submarine. Maybe you've never even seen a submarine. And yet you know the word submarine. And how is it that you know the word submarine, or at least at least you know the word in Korean, um, which I should actually remember the word in Korean, um, because I have read it to my son so many times. Yeah, chamsuhan. Okay, so the word chamsuhan. How do you know this word? Well, probably for most of you, you know this word actually through books, through the process of reading and, and, and seeing images of what a submarine is and the submarine traveling beneath the ocean. And, and a lot of this is where you actually derive your understanding of the word. And so, again, stories and written language, the process of reading exposes us to a um, variety of contexts and a variety of, of um, content or concepts that we don't that we don't experience in our daily life. Just so you know, uh, research shows that the number of words a person knows depends largely on how much they read, and people who read a lot uh, have uh, much larger vocabularies. Um, uh, about four times as large of a vocabulary as people who rarely read. What are these rare words that I was talking about? These rare words that are not necessarily difficult words. Rare does not mean difficult. So for example, uh, I will often um, say to someone maybe, ah, oh, here, sit down, sit down in this chair. So a chair might be a common word, sit would be a common word, down, of course, would be a common word. Um, but in the written language, perhaps uh, a story would be describing the chair as the gray chair. Please. He sat down in the gray um, fabric chair. Gray is actually an uncommon word. Colors are not so common in the spoken language. We don't say things like, turn on the black television. We just say, turn on the television. Uh, shapes uh, and size words, these often very descriptive words, we don't use a lot in our spoken language. So to expose children to a, um, uh, a variety of rare words, it's often good to read to them. Because reading, uh, the, uh, the writers often are more descriptive with their language during the writing process. Children's books contain words and context and visual connections that allow for the acquisition of these words. So again, we have these rare words. We have, for example, a gray chair, and children's books will have an image of then a gray chair that we can then help build the associations, build the connections between the symbolic, the symbol, and the meaning. And in this case, it would be a visual, a visual meaning through a picture or an image. And so again, this is why uh, children's books are so important. Uh, and then I hope that you look at this list for a number of rare words met per thousand words. So this means that if I were speaking to someone and I, we were speaking and I said a thousand words, generally, if I was having a, an adult conversation of those 1,000 words, only 17.3 of the words would be rare words. Uh, if I was talking to a child, let's say a, a three-year-old child, only nine of those words out of a thousand, so 0.9 percent, would, um, would be rare words. However, if we were reading a children's book, you'll see that children's books contain almost 31 rare words for every thousand words. So again, we're looking at a, a, a possibly triple the rate of exposure to rare words just through a children's book. And again, the children's books are great because they also have the imagery that help facilitate uh, the association process and the build and the um, opportunity to build those associations and bring meaning to the symbolic language or to the symbolic words.
Okay. Uh, good luck finishing up your notes, and I look forward. Well, I look forward to kind of look forward to reading them and grading them. All right. See you next week. Bye.